All right, let's get started. I think we have everyone here to get started. Um, well, I've started recording and everything, so we're good. Um, it's a little bit weird if you watch the recording later for whatever reason. The camera is rotated, so I'm uh, I'm sideways. So just turn your turn your monitor uh, sideways or whatever. Um, oh yeah, I could show you. There you go. See up there. Isn't that wonderful. All right. Um, <clears throat> So uh, I'm going to sit here so I can try to be in the camera here mostly. Um, so uh, you should have um, responded to the, the three different sets of questions for today. One being in response to our discussion last week. Um, one being to get you brainstorming about uh, advice for the freshmen. And then the third one in response of kind of thinking about what today's discussion is going to be, that being graduate school. Before we get to that main topic, I'll let you know that uh, next week I will make available to you the set of questions that all of the freshmen submitted last year, plus um, the first two weeks of questions from the freshmen this year as well. So you're going to have um, some questions to, to prompt you for additional work on that. At, at that point, you really probably need to get started on figuring out um, how, as a group, you're going to do the advice session. I will come up with um, some dates here before next week. Um, the other thing I want to let you know is that next week and the following week, I am going to set up uh, as being the, the um, exam, the standardized exam that we work on. Um, so, uh, and I will post uh, an example exam that you can use to, to look and see what those problems are like. Again, remember, I don't want you to cram. I want this to be a reflection of what you do know in the, the discipline at, at this point. All right, it's a it's a up to a two hour test, but it's in two sections. So we will take section one next week and we will take section two the following week. Okay, so um, uh, so you'll be able to break it up into, into those two parts right there. Um, for those of you who are athletes, well, let's coordinate on a time to make sure you're able to take it so that you don't have to interrupt the test or, or miss practice or whatever. So we'll, we'll figure out an alternative time. But for the rest of you, uh, please come. Uh, I'll figure out where we're going to do it because it is online, electronic. Um, so either it might be bring your laptop and I would love to do it in there, but I think they have a lab right now. Uh, so um, I'll give you more information about those details as it arrives. Um, let me see. So that's kind of logistic. There will be some more questions um, popping up over the next week or two to get you prompted for, for future discussions after the exam. All right. Any questions that you have for me? All right, well, let's get started on the main topic for today, um, that being grad school. Usually when we do this, and you'll remember when you're a freshman, this being true, uh, for the retreat, I tend to like to do this as a panel discussion so you can get multiple pieces of input, but that's just the, that's the negative downsides of um, not being able to go away and have other faculty be present. So I'm going to try to um, be as broad based as I can. I'm going to base what I say uh, based on two things. 
Uh, one is the responses that I've already looked at in the class. So um, uh, if you answered things by last evening and you saw that I've already graded it, those will kind of fit into um, the answers that, that I give. But um, more broadly, I'm going to say things based on just conversations that I've had in my time here with a, a lot of uh, students um, considering or not considering grad school. Uh, <laughs> and so um, the, the first thing that uh, I want to say before we go on is um, I'm not trying to suggest that everyone in this classroom should attend grad school. Um, some of you know that that's a great fit for you. Some of you aren't sure, and some of you know it's a terrible fit for you. Um, so, ba you know, based on on that, um, I, I, I'm you're probably right in each of those categories. There aren't too many people who think, oh, grad school is a terrible idea for me, when it actually is a good idea. But there's a lot of people in uh, the room who aren't sure. And so I especially want to be able to help you make a more informed decision. And the reason why I'm doing this early in the semester is so that if it ends up being something that you want to pursue, then you have enough time to be able to pursue it in a, um, in a manner that is uh, not rushed or um, that is that makes you um, uh, opt out of certain choices that you would have liked to if you had started sooner. Okay, so um, so so that's why I'm doing it early, and that's uh, and that's why uh, I'm presenting it, even though I know it's not for everyone necessarily. I. My experience is that a lot of people are, are hesitant to go to grad school for um, two primary reasons. There are a lot of other reasons, but the two biggest reasons that uh, keep people from even considering grad school are um, one, financial, um, and two, uh, maybe I'll call fatigue. Okay, so the, the first one, financial. Um, you're, you're paying a lot of money to come here to Taylor, um, and some of you have earned good scholarships to come here, but there's, there's plenty of you who still have to make up a lot, even if you have a good scholarship, right? And, and for many of you, that means some sort of, of loan, and, and I understand that. And that some of you, it's a, it's a significant loan. It's not it's not a small amount. And so when you think about how much you've already accrued in debt to consider going to school for an even longer period of time seems kind of daunting. And it seems like, uh, is that really the right use of my finances? Um, and so uh, the first thing I wanna say is that in computer science, and more generally in the sciences, the hard sciences in general, um, you should not have to incur any more educational cost. Okay, You should not have to pay another dime for grad school after you get out of Taylor. And that is true no matter what mechanism you employ towards getting your graduate degree whether that is um, going to school directly or it's going to work and having your employer pay for work, okay? In either case, you should not pay another dime of tuition after you leave Taylor. If you're getting a degree in computer science, computer engineering, chemistry, physics, whatever the case is, you should not have to pay any more tuition. Okay, so either that is because at the school you go to, the school will pay for you. Okay, and there are 
three general ways that the school will pay for you. Um, and by pay for you, I don't just mean tuition. I mean pay for you plus pay a, a stipend for living on top of that. Okay, so uh, not only should they be paying for your tuition, but they should be paying enough that you can find adequate housing and pay for food and, and general living expenses. Okay, every school that takes you seriously is going to offer those two things for you, that tuition and stipend. That stipend is going to come in the form of um, either what's called a fellowship or an assistantship. Uh, and the fellowship is the most preferred mechanism for them paying for you. Because a fellowship is just like a scholarship is here, right? You get the money and that's all. You, you get to do whatever you want to do in your graduate work. And so they're, they're, those are most prestigious. They don't just hand those out to, to every student. Um, there's usually some sort of reason why they, they give you that, either because you've, you've demonstrated good work in the past or you've, they've, you've got a connection with, with them that you've facilitated or um, you've applied for some national fellowship that they accept. Um, sometimes the fellowships do come from the United States government, uh, especially on the National Science Foundation, um, or if you're in cybersecurity, maybe the Department of Defense or um, the NSA or something like that. So there is money from the, the government to, to pay for these kinds of things. Um, lower down on the rung, but um, still usually the same amount of money is uh, an assistantship. And assistantships come in one of two forms. There's a research assistantship and a teaching assistantship. Okay, and you can kind of get by their names what the expectation is for you in order for you to get that money. A teaching assistantship, you're going to be expected to be a TA for some course uh, during your time there. And so um, usually um, that means at least being in the lab. Uh, oftentimes it means grading many or most of the assignments in the course. Um, it sometimes can actually involve teaching the course itself and uh, covering the material um, and, and help helping the students out. That is quite varied. It depends upon the institution that you go to. It depends upon the professor who's in charge of that class. Um, it depends upon your experience level already. A number of things go into factor how much uh, teaching versus lab duties that, that you're expected to do. At a lot of really big universities, a teaching assistantship is seen kind of as a um, the lowest rung on these three tiers because everything at these big university centers around research. So the whole reason why the professor needs a teaching assistant is because they want to focus their time on research, not focus their time on teaching. Okay. And so they need someone else to do all the dirty work for them. Okay. Um, it's, it sounds really backwards um, because you're at a university, but the point of that university is not teaching. That's a secondary outcome. The primary outcome is generating research. Okay. Um, and, and I'm not exaggerating. You're, the professors at these institutions, their livelihood, their tenure and their promotion is directly connected to how much grant money they bring into the institution. It's almost never connected to uh, teaching evaluations from students. Um, much less getting good teaching evaluations from students. All right. Um, and so, of course, the faculty are going to focus on research. And of course, that's going to be their primary focus. Um, and so at those kind of institutions, um, 
if they give you a teaching assistantship, they need the help that that's what the outside world thinks is the primary responsibility of the university. And so they still have to be teaching classes and helping students get get through the material. And so the teaching assistant is the primary um, aid in, in making that happen. Um, but they don't, the pro research professors don't want their students to be doing the teach assistant because then that's time that takes away from their ability to help them do research. So that's why at those institutions, the teaching assistance is, um, is considered kind of a lower level. At kind of a mid-tier university, it's more varied. There are some institutions that really do value teaching and, and value it highly. And you have some really amazing teaching professors at those institutions. Um, and they will really try to help people become good teachers. They want to help students learn and um, having their, their student become a, a teaching assistant is not seen as a negative, but it's seen as helping the, the true purpose of a university and that is growing learning in, in, in the students. Um, but there are some people at these mid-level universities that are trying to get to those top level universities and they kind of have the same mentality there too. So it's a little bit more mixed. It's kind of the, the next tier down of the universities, whether a teaching assistant is, is low level or seen as equivalent with a research assistantship. A research assistantship is again, what its name implies, you're getting paid to do research. Okay. Uh, and, and so you attend your classes as a graduate student, and then you spend most of your time and energy doing research in a field that of, of your choice. Um, so every student, when they get accepted to a graduate school, should get one of those three forms of payment, a fellowship, a teaching assistantship, or a research assistantship. And those should come with full tuition plus a stipend. Okay, so you should not have to worry about, go about going further in debt. Additionally, while you're attending graduate school, just like during undergraduate school, your debt, um, you're not paying interest payments on your debt, that continues to be true during graduate school. So your debt doesn't get larger while you're in graduate school. It just stays the, the same as when you graduated. Okay. So in, in general, money um, going further into debt is, should not be what prevents you from going to graduate school. Okay. So that's the, the first question. Did you have a, a question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the, one of the big barriers to graduate school. The other big barrier that I mentioned is fatigue. Just like I have been in school since kindergarten and I just need a break. I, I cannot do any more school. Um, and that's a, that's a very true, sensation. I'm not going to try to pretend it isn't real or isn't um, uh, valid. Uh, I, I will say that um, maybe to partially counter it is that um, just like college is a different type of learning than high school was for you, I hope. <clears throat> Graduate school is a different type of learning from either of those two. Okay. Um, and one of the ways that it's different is that usually you're not taking classes that people tell you to take. You're taking classes that you choose to take. At, every school does it differently. So this is not universal. But at my graduate school, the master's degree was take nine classes. Okay. And then to get the PhD, 
it was take an additional three um, plus research for, for both of those. And that's as specific as it got. Okay, so imagine the freedom that you have when all you're told to do is take classes that are interesting to you. It's a, it's a, it's a different way of going about school than fulfilling certain requirements. And that nine classes isn't nine classes in a year. That was nine classes over the course of two-ish years. Okay, and that was on a quarter system. So that would be more like the equivalent of take six classes in two years. Okay, so you are not being bombarded with class after class after class and all you're doing is homework and um, and responding to, to the classes. There's a lot more time to be thoughtful and go in depth and pursue those classes that are interesting to you and the ones that you think are worthwhile and going to help you with your, your research um, and be able to do, do something that is, is, is going to be in, enjoyable for you. So yes, I did go to classes, but it was a different level of class and it was a different um, intensity of class. Because um, even while you're going to classes, they want you to start thinking about your research. Even your first semester, they want you to think, okay, what, what's something that you can look into? What's something that you can get your teeth uh, wet on? What's something that is going to excite you about the next uh, few years while, while you're here at your institution that's going to produce interesting work? And you can't do that if all you're doing is going to classes every day. So, so the load for classes um, starts lower than it is already here for you at Taylor and gets less. Okay, so um, I'll be honest, when I got to graduate school, it felt more like work than school. And it felt more like work to me because of the two things we just talked about. First of all, I was getting paid, right? I had a stipend and a, a, you know, a weekly check that was coming in. And I was going into the office and working on stuff that wasn't just class related. So it felt more like a job at that point than, than school to me. Um, so those are the two kind of big barriers that I know a lot of people wrestle with. And I, I want to let you know that, you know, money shouldn't be the issue. Uh, fatigue could be the issue, but take it with a little bit of a caveat there. All right. Um, so before I continue, I, I could talk and have talked for long periods of time on this topic with people before. What kind of questions uh, do you have for me already based on, on what I just uh, said here this afternoon? Yeah, Adam and then Daisy. So I know you said that you're taking less classes yeah. uh, and spending some time on research. How does like the course, like how does the workload compare like per class uh, like to undergrad? Like is each class about as much work, would you say, a little bit more? Yeah, the, 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 the workload per class tends to be a little bit higher. Um, and uh, because they know that you're not taking as many classes. Plus, they expect you to be um, intrinsically motivated to do to, to work. Um, the expectation is, as a graduate student, you should be doing A work in all, all of your classes. So you should mostly get A's. Um, a B or here or there is, is OK. In grad school, a C is failing. They don't, it's, that's an unwritten rule. But that's, a C is, is, is totally terrible in graduate school. Um, and so, so there might just be more of a workload, right, because there's a higher expectation of the performance that, that you accomplish in it. Um, 
So, yes, yeah, so, but it's not like double the, the load or something like that. It's, it's incrementally larger. Daisy? So I was wondering what it looks like if you like go to a school like Purdue and they accept you and fund you for like cybersecurity, for instance. Uh -huh. And then you find in your first class or two that like, I don't really love cybersecurity more. I like web dev better. Mm -hmm. If I switch out of that program to a different one, do I lose like funding and stuff? That's a great question. And um, so dealing with, with funding is, is the most difficult. And it, the, the answer depends back to the first question on what your funding was like to begin with. Um, so if you have a fellowship, you have the greatest flexibility because whoever is giving you that fellowship has just promised to let you have that money no matter what you do. Um, and so if you have a fellowship, yeah, you, you can go wherever you've, you've got that freedom. If you have a research assistantship, that is usually coming from a particular professor in the department who is who has a specific research agenda that he's or she is trying to accomplish. Um, and so if you decide that your topic area has switched dramatically, then he or she is not going to be excited to continue to fund you for research that doesn't meet um, his or her agenda. Some faculty are very concentrated um, and talk about a very small set of topics. And so if you're under that faculty member um, it, and you have a research assistantship, it's it's hard to switch. Um, some faculty are a lot more willing to have variety in the type of work that their, their students investigate. So if you're the type of student who says, I'm interested in grad school, but I'm not 100% sure about my topical area, one of the things that you would want to do is find a school that that would pair you up with someone who has more of that flexibility so that you're not in that kind of uh, awkward situation where you know the money's coming from this person who wants you to do this, but you'd rather do this instead. A teaching assistantship uh, oftentimes also allows you to have that flexibility because the money again is not coming towards a re research agenda it's coming from a teaching agenda and uh, and so there, there's flexibility that way as well um, so it's hard for me to go one fast rule but there are times when it is problematic yes um, so uh, so yeah, you do want to watch that a little bit. Yeah, Colin. How hard would it be to go to grad school for, say, a major that, like, I'm not, like, I'm computer engineering, but let's say I want to go to, like, aerospace. How hard would it be to get into something that you're kind of, like, kind of qualified for, but not entirely? So how hard is it to get into a major that's not the same as the undergraduate degree program that you did? Um, that depends, again, on uh, the major you're trying to get into. Um, is there like a test that you take before you get accepted to grad school? There is, but not for that purpose. Um, so it depends upon how closely aligned your majors are. Um, so as a computer engineer, and the example you gave is aerospace engineering, there is an overlap in engineering. And so they would have a certain base expectation of courses that you've taken that are going to apply, that you, that you understand. Um, and so the question that would have to take place there is do we think that you can make that jump from your current training to what's necessary in in that field 
compared with the other candidates that we have in the pool. So, um, and that's why it's hard to, to know. Um, you're in much better shape than people who are coming from a liberal arts discipline without any technical training. But you're not as qualified in their minds as someone who did do more aerospace oriented things. Um, but you can, you can target and say, hey, I'm going to be focused on this part of aerospace engineering, which is connected to my computer engineering. And so they're tied to that way. Um, uh, you could be doing things like working on the satellite projects here or doing internships at, at NSL and stuff to try to bridge that gap for yourself. So you can do things if you know that computer science or computer engineering is not exactly what you want to do to convince the people at that institution that it's not a risk in, in taking you on. What's more important um, than the topics that you've taken is that you demonstrate that you're an independent learner and that you um, are uh, able to, to take on open-ended projects like a, a research project would be. Um, because if they trust that, that you have those qualities, that, that you can learn to learn, and that you can do these large open-ended projects, they're going to be much more likely to pursue you than someone maybe within the field but doesn't have those characteristics because they know that you're going to have a better chance of success than, than them. So what you want to do is be able to demonstrate that by participating on uh, in activities now that you can point to as part of your application process that demonstrates that is, is the type of, of candidate you would be. Um, yeah, so that that is um, that that varies. I I know some people who've wanted to get into computer science degrees, and they've just taken uh, like summer courses and stuff in computer science, so they can do like re learn how to program and stuff. They don't have to take everything in the computer science, but if, if they have a discipline that shows that they know how to learn, they're independent learners, and they can begin to program and do that competently, the, the different institutions oftentimes let them into the computer science field um, be, because that's the values that, that they're looking for from, from students, graduate students specifically. Um, I can, as an example, my undergraduate was here at Taylor. I got, at that time there, it wasn't even a, an engineering program here at Taylor. I have a computer science degree from Taylor, but my graduate degree is in computer engineering. So there are certain engineering classes that I've never taken um, because they're, they tend to be part of the undergraduate curriculum. They don't tend to be part of the graduate curriculum. Uh, and, um, and so, uh, but because I demonstrated a capability of, of doing research at um, Argonne National Laboratory, that was more interesting to them than the fact that I had a computer engineering degree. Uh, go ahead, David, and then, then Adam. Uh, oh, sure. so, who is it? You. Uh, have you been a teaching assistant in graduate school? Have I been a teaching assistant in graduate school? I have. Okay. Do you think it's helpful for you now that you're teaching university classes? Um, is it helpful for me now that I'm teaching classes? I think it could have been helpful. The way it, um, it was a little bit helpful, um, but it wasn't as helpful as it could have been. Um, and that was because I was at a research one institution. Um, my, I got more from my teaching assistants. I got more than a lot of students did at my university because my graduate advisor was um, 
on maternity leave. Um, and so uh, she didn't want to have to, um, she didn't want to have to stop at the beginning of the, the quarter. She just wanted to go and as long as she could into the quarter before she gave birth. Um, and so I took over the class from her when, when uh, her daughter was born. Um, and so I was really doing a lot of the teaching in that course. Um, but it was for say four weeks of the course rather than 15 weeks of the course. Again, she had set up all the materials. Um, she had set up all the labs. She had set up all the lectures and the exams and so forth. And so um, in that sense, it wasn't as helpful as it could have been. I wasn't really designing the course. I wasn't delivering the content that I thought was important. I wasn't kind of culling the important ideas and, and making the slides and, and, and all those kinds of things. So that's where it wasn't as good of an experience as it could have been. Uh, but it was better than just being a research assistantship. Um, because at, at my institution, there, there wasn't a value on teaching. There's, there's increased a value in teaching since I left, actually. Um, and um, yeah, those of you who have had um, Dr. Hipschman, I think, see that, 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 that they really have developed teaching in, in him. Uh, he went to the same institution as I did just 10 years later. Um, so, uh, yes, I think it's value. It can be valuable. And if that's something that you want to do, if you want to be a teaching, a teaching instructor, that's one way that you can try to value one school or another is ask that question. Is this something that they value and will they pour into their teaching assistance or not, or not? Um, uh, because there are some schools where they really do, and it really pumps out some really amazing qualified teacher right when they graduate. You know, what, what I graduated with is I knew how to do research. Um, and I knew I wanted to teach and I liked to help people to teach, but I didn't have any tools in my tool belt for, for how to do that effectively. And so I had to learn, uh, I had to learn a lot about how to, to do that better. Um, so uh, the, there were a lot of growing pains that I've gone through because I didn't have that formal training. I've had to um, teach myself. Yeah, Kevin. Oh, yeah. So going back to the transition that you said you made from computer science and undergrad to computer engineering and masters, uh, when you got to the graduate level and you were taking engineering courses instead of computer science courses, did you find that there was a, a gap in knowledge that you had to make up on your own? Or in your experience, did you feel like the transition was pretty smooth? Um, the transition from computer science to computer engineering there were gaps in knowledge um, that I didn't even know I had. Um, and, um, and so it, it felt mostly smooth to me because I was able to kind of maneuver along the, the parts that I did know. Like, okay, I'll understand this computer engineering topic from a computer scientist's perspective. Um, and that was enough to kind of get through those particular courses or or excel in those particular courses depending upon which ones we're talking about um but then when i came back and began to have to teach those courses that's when <laughs> the gaps in knowledge really uh because it's one thing to take a class it's a whole nother thing to, to teach the class um and so yeah there were gaps in knowledge uh but i didn't I wasn't even fully aware of them until even after I completed my classes. Yeah, Kendall. So did you say where you went to grad school? Uh, no, I didn't. Thank you. On purpose? Uh, no. <laughs> Just slip of mind. Uh, I went to um, I went to Northwestern University in uh, Evanston, Illinois. Um, I, um, I applied to a number of, <clears throat> let me 
let me back up. Between my junior and senior years at Taylor, I did a uh, practicum at Argonne National Laboratories. Um, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I was not unlike many of you when it came to money and I couldn't afford to go to Taylor for four years. And so I did the accelerated program so I could finish in three and a half. Um, and uh, so I was done in December, but I knew grad school wasn't going to start until the, the fall. Um, and so I had an invitation to come back to Argonne National Laboratory. And uh, I took them up on that. And um, I was really enjoying the work that I was doing there. Um, roughly speaking, what it was, was a proof of concept that cloud computing would work. Um, and there is a big, gigantic demonstration of this fact in November of that year. Basically, the entire department that I worked in was was trying to demonstrate that the government should keep funding them because they are able to make this kind of a demonstration. Um, and so I had um, gotten accepted into uh, several graduate schools, but asked to defer them because I wanted to participate in this exciting research project for, for me. Um, so I continued to work through that that fall, um, and I was kind of being me and not paying attention to deadlines and um, missed a lot of deadlines for reapplying to graduate schools that, that following year. Um, so I, I sent around um, applications to um, schools nearby Argonne because my advisor, um, research advisor at Argonne liked the work that I did and he, and he said that he would be willing to um, pay for my schooling um, if I continue to do research for him at the, at the laboratory. Um, and he also was a professor at the University of Chicago. So um, I applied to the University of Chicago, Northwestern University in DePaul, um, so forth. Um, and I wrote on that uh, all the applications that I didn't need funding because of this um, verbal agreement I had with this advisor, which is completely shocking and unusual to to these graduate committees, because they're, like I said, they're used to having to provide funding for uh, researchers. And I had this track record by working at Northwestern that they knew that I could do research. Um, uh, and so, um, I don't know exactly when it was, say May, sometime late in the spring. Northwestern contacted me and said, now this, uh, this bit about you not needing funding, is that because like you're independently wealthy or what's going on here? <laughs> so I, I explained the situation to them and they said, so if we offered you a fellowship, would you take it? So like, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, because like I said, the fellowship is kind of the, the best um, option available to you gives you a great amount of freedom. Um, and so that's why I ended up in at, at Northwestern because um, my advisor who I ended up working at Northwestern was doing work at Argonne. And so I had seen her doing her work there. Um, and I was impressed with what she did. I had this fellowship opportunity. And so that's why I ended up at Northwestern. It's not a very generalizable plan for, <laughs> for you, but it, it gives you an idea of a little bit of the serendipity involved and the fact that you should continue to pursue it 
um, and just let God kind of intervene in, in the way that, that only he can do that way. I, it really did feel like uh, as I was praying for guidance and trying to figure out how I could overcome my failure as not uh, following deadlines, it just really felt um, it felt like it was from him to make this opening available to me. Um, one of the great things for me about having a fellowship that first year is that I was kind of a free agent. I wasn't beholden to any particular researcher. Uh, I cannot emphasize enough, if you decide to go to graduate school, that you need, you. The most important thing about graduate school is your graduate advisor. And I am not exaggerating when I say that statement. It's more important than the school that you go to. It's more important than um, anything else because it is your research advisor that it is who you interact with on a daily basis. They're the ones who teach you how to do research. They're the ones who teach you how to write a research paper. They're the ones who are talking you up with their colleagues when they're at their conferences and you're not quite there yet. They're the ones who are telling you that this is a great idea that they just don't have time to work on and so you should pursue it because it's a really cool idea. They're the ones who find the money that pay for your research assistantships and your teaching assistantships. They're, they're the ones who tell you you're done and it's time to move on or worse, you're here and I'm going to keep you here forever. Right. <clears throat> um, they're, they're the ones ultimately who give you your degree. It's not, Officially, it's the institution, but in reality, it's your advisor. And so you want to find that advisor that makes it the best experience possible. Um, and I know you've heard the saying, it's not what you know, but who you know, that totally applies in this situation. You're going to be judged as far as your graduate degree is concerned, not with, within the field, not by the institution that you get your degree from, but from the research advisor that you worked under. Everyone in that field knows who you're working for. They know the quality of work that they have, the quality of work that they promote, the quality of work that they accept. And so there's, a great deal of understanding about, therefore, what quality of work you produced if you were working under them. They know if it's worthwhile or just meaningless. They know if they're, um, if they're the type of person who, to achieve, you have to work 80 hours a week to make progress or if you can kind of skate by and hang out on the tennis courts most of the days and then show up a couple days of the week. Right. Everyone in your field already knows all this information and you're being judged by your association with this advisor. Okay. And to be honest, it's totally fair because the quality of research that you produce, even if you're an amazing, if you've got amazing internal abilities to do research, can be squashed by a terrible research advisor. And vice versa, even if you're kind of a mediocre researcher, an amazing advisor can bring out the best in you and make you a very good researcher because they teach you how to do it well. So when, when you're looking for a graduate school, you're not looking for a graduate school. You're looking for a graduate advisor. 
Okay. So you have in your mind, because you, like most other people, when you're not yet connected to the field, you only have one way to judge someone's graduate credentials, and that is by the institution. But you want to find that graduate advisor who, who maybe is at one of those great institutions, but maybe is not quite yet at one of those institutions. They're on their way there, but they haven't yet gotten there yet. Um, and, and so when you're looking for graduate advisors, you want to look at this interests me or this doesn't interest me. I need to meet that advisor and see if we click and connect. Could I work with this person 40, 50, 60 hours a week? I'm going to talk to their other graduate students and see, you know, do they invest in, in me personally? Do they help me succeed in my career? Are they writing um, letters of recommendation for others? Are they keeping their graduate students here a reasonable amount of time or is it six, seven, eight, nine years and it seems like they're never leaving? Okay. The graduate students are an invaluable source of this kind of information. They have no incentive to lie to you <laughs> about this information. The graduate advisor does. They want you there as a student. So they're going to always paint themselves in their best possible way. I don't know very many graduate students that do. Even if, even if their graduate advisor is a taskmaster, they'll tell you that usually. Um, so, you, so if you've got in your mind, okay, you know, the best schools are like, Berkeley and MIT and Stanford. Yeah, they are. And, and the cool thing about them is they tend to have really great researchers there. But it's not exclusive to there. And maybe the field you're interested in hasn't quite percolated up to those, in, um, those high level institutions. And there are people at other institutions that aren't seen in that same light as amazing schools, but they can produce just as good, if not better quality research from those alternative institutions. So don't be afraid to pursue an advisor outside of this, you know, I think this is an amazing school or not. Um, my suggestion for how to find a research advisor is if you do know what you're interested in, start finding papers in that field. Start finding people who write interesting things to you. Say, that's interesting. I wouldn't mind looking into that and doing more. Oh, this person writes interesting things about a lot of things. I might want to be in their group. They make me think. They make me think hard. <clears throat> Oh, that sounds really fun. I'd love to, to do that for a long piece of time. Because whatever you end up doing is going to be, you know, a significant part of your educational experience. So you want to be sure that that is something that you would in, enjoy. Um, send out your applications then to those places that have those advisors in, in those areas that, that you're interested in. So I can't um, emphasize enough the importance of that research advisor. Yes. Student from a 30,000 foot view, what would you say is the purpose of grad school? Uh, it can vary. Um, I would say there, um, maybe there are three primary purposes that, that you might encounter. So uh, first, maybe most obvious, is that you're trying to train future academics. So 
they need to learn how to do research, they need to learn how to teach, and they're going to be involved in an institution. That's probably, in this classroom, probably the least appealing to the largest segment of you, to be honest, even though it's the most obvious purpose. Uh, purpose number two is that it allows you to begin to explore um, areas of computer science um, independently. You're no longer under such guidance as you are in undergraduate school, right? Most of the time you have some project that we've chosen for you. You've got homework that you have to do. You have to read the book that we tell you to do. And that's kind of the extent of your classes and, and your learning. Whereas in graduate school, it's much more um, a pursuit, an independent pursuit of, of learning and, and knowledge. Um, and so it's, um, and so it's very um, useful um, for, uh, say, you want to do, rather than, let's say you say, I want to be an industry, the graduate degree then is helping you be the type of person in industry who's going to be the system architect, the person who's going to say, what's the future for this company going to hold? I'm going to position our company to um, use uh, to, to take advantage of what the future is and and um, and and help us um, do interesting new things as a result rather than being the person who gets hired on to the company once the company has already set that direction and you're trying to achieve someone else's vision um, so um, so that would be kind of the, the, the second thing is this kind of independent learning. Um, and the cool thing about it is, unlike a job, uh, you have a little bit more freedom on what you want to explore because it doesn't have to produce a bottom line immediately. Um, so it gives you a little bit more freedom that way before you get into a job. Uh, because the, the kind of the third purpose maybe of graduate school is that you um, are learning how to do kind of a research and development project. Um, and and I, I dif distinguish those independent learning from research and development because one is much more targeted. We're, we're trying to do this particular thing. We're, we have a product or we have a process that we're trying to engineer and, and make as opposed to just kind of learn about the world and see what um, what kind of happens kind of kind of thing um, and that is also very valuable right because without the research and development efforts uh, our companies would stagnate um, and they would they would get overtaken by startups and other in um, companies that are innovative in, in, in nature and come up with new ideas. Um, so while the first one is the most obvious, kind of building academics, the other two are where a large, much larger portion of the population benefits from graduate school learning. Um, so much so that let me talk about a second route into graduate school that probably is going to be a larger, to, frankly, that a larger number of you are going to do. And that is instead of immediately going to graduate school, it's having the company that you work for pay for your graduate school because they see the value of graduate school along those the second two um, points that I just mentioned. Um, usually, if you do that route, it's the same thing as I said before, you're not paying for your graduate school. Your company is paying for your graduate school um, and you're getting whatever your normal salary is on, on top of that. Uh, because you uh, do have a job, usually this path is slower. 
usually the company is going to say you can take one class at a time. Uh, and so it takes longer to get through the graduate degree one class at a time than taking your going as a full time student. Um, but um, oftentimes the company that you're working for has something interesting that they want you to work on that's related to the classes that you're taking. And so the, they and the university will both allow you to work to tie your work project to your university uh, project research in some way. So it's not like you have to do your work and then you do your school and they're independent from each other. They can be tightly integrated together. And so it benefits both the institution and the employer as, as far as having that. But um, instead of it being like a two year degree for your master's, it's more like a three to five year degree for your master's because you, you've slowed down the, the process. Um, so, you know, there's, there's give and take in, in that kind of an arrangement. Um, a lot of students like to ask, which one is better? And that's a really hard question to, to answer. Um, so I will give some, some pros for both approaches. And so it will obviously imply cons for the, the other side. So the pro for going immediately into graduate school is that um, I would say there's two major pros. There's a, there's a number of other ones. First one is, while you will be being paid tuition and you will be paid a stipend, it's probably less than what industry will pay you for a salary. Okay, so it's easier to work on a lower salary if you've kind of already been living in that mentality. And right? so most of you are not living high in the hog right now. You know what it is to kind of pinch pennies. You know how it is to save money. And so going from that experience into graduate school feels pretty natural. But if you were to go into industry and make a very comfortable living and then switch back into graduate school for a lot of us humans, that's a really difficult thing to do because we get used to living at a certain lifestyle, spending a certain amount of money, going out to eat, having a nice house or a car, um, spending time the, the way that we do with our friends and our family. And it's hard to cut back. It's easier to add on. It's not so easy to cut back. So that's the first pros. It's just easier to transition into graduate school um, from undergraduate school from a mentality um, cost per point of view. Um, the other one is a different mentality and that's that you're just used to being at school. You know what the kind of um, routine is. And so th that's also easy to just go from undergraduate to graduate school and keep that going. And, and the topics should be more fresh in your mind. Every year after you leave uh, undergraduate school, before you get back to graduate school, there's a decay in, in what you've done, do you, do you still remember it as well as, as deeply as fresh as you, as you did when immediately after you took those, those classes and those topics. So those are the pros. You're, you're more fresh in the material. You're used to being in a school environment and you probably are used to, um, you know, watching your, your spending and being, um, being careful with, with, with it. On the other side, one of the nice things about going to work first before you go to graduate school is, um, I don't know how to say this politely, um, is that you learn how to be a uh, uh, 
diligent worker. I think a lot of uh, undergraduate students, and this isn't meant to be targeted at anyone in here, but in general, a lot of undergraduate students are not very good with time management. Um, and and um, so uh, you have you have a lot of free time you don't even realize you have. And once you start working, that kind of becomes more obvious. Um, and you learn how to budget and manage your time well. So then when you get to graduate school, you've learned that skill and you are much more effective in the graduate school as a result of it. Then the students who come from undergraduate school haven't learned that skill. And like I said, working in graduate school kind of feels like work. So that's a huge bonus of having worked first over um, going directly in. Um, if, if that doesn't apply to you, uh, and I know I've worked with some of you, you guys do have very good time management skills, that's, that's a non-issue uh, for you. But that, that's an overgeneralization. It's especially true when you start talking about combining that with the topic we talked about last week, which is balancing career and family. When you have a family, you don't have time to just throw away. You're going to have very targeted, I'm going to work on <laughs> this project at this time because I need to get home and spend time with my family. Um, and, or I need to be at work and do that because I, I really, really don't have free time to just goof off and and, and so forth. Um, I, to be honest, I'm super thankful that I was single through most of my graduate school um, because uh, I think I would have struggled immensely to try to, to balance graduate school and, and a wife and definitely children. That would not have been something I would have been very successful at. Um, but that's that's a personal thing. If you look at the people in our department, um, Dr. Nurkla, uh, Dr. Stanley, uh, Dr. Denning, uh, all started graduate school after they were married. Um, and and succeeded quite well. So you, you can definitely, you definitely can do it. Um, it just takes something I don't have. <coughs> um, more questions. I feel like I've been, yeah, go ahead. Uh, is it reasonable to expect that if you're looking at a grad school program online that they'll have like either most of their, or all of their courses that you could take listed, or is that something that you can only get if you require with them directly? At this point, I would expect any reasonable institution to advertise the school, the classes that they have available and the classes that they require from you. Um, that would be, that would be kind of scary if you can't find that information. If not, I mean, especially if you contact them and ask them for it and you still aren't able to get it. I feel like I've been kind of talking in monotone today. Like maybe grad school seems like kind of like, uh, I want, <laughs> let me change my tone a little bit because to me, graduate school was a totally exciting time of my life. I really enjoyed it. I loved being in graduate school. I loved learning. Well, I love learning in general. And so graduate school was like the optimal place for, for me because I got to explore exactly what I wanted to do as deeply as I wanted to do. And there was no one telling me you're done. It was me saying, oh, I could do this and I could do this. And this is really interesting. Right. It was 
it was super amazing. I had a lot of flexibility on what I did and when I did it, um, which, which gave me flexibility outside of graduate school um, in the sense that um, I was able to do things that I don't think I would have done if I had a more structured nine to five job. Um, two of the most prominent examples would be um, first, I really started to get into running. I had never run before, and I actually ran marathons in, in graduate school, and I really enjoyed that. It was, it was, um, I was much more fit than I am now, um, and and it was, it was great, and and because I didn't have this nine to five thing, you know, when it got close to the marathon time and I needed to run a three hour training run, I could find time in my schedule for that. It's a, even uh, on a Saturday or whatever, it's hard to do. Um, I couldn't imagine doing that now. Um, um, the other thing was um, that I was able to more effectively participate in the church I was involved in um, because I could um, set aside an evening to be um, working with the, the high school youth group that, that at the school um, or the the small group that I that I was in um, was quite accessible to me because I could just you know write off that evening as that's my that's my time for small group and it was really um, easy for me to to find a really amazing small group because I didn't have a um, kind of out of bounds night, I found the small group that I wanted and then made that evening out of bounds for, for all other activities. And that was, that was an amazing time for me spiritually. And I don't know if um, I would have had that same opportunity if I had a much more uh, rigid schedule. Um, and it's where I met my wife. It's, um, it, it was a really good time very, very good time uh, for me. Um, I made amazing friendships with the people that I went to school with. It was the first time really that I um, had close connections with international students. Um, in fact, as a, an American, I was in a minority in, in my institution, there were there were more Chinese and Indians than than any other nationality. Maybe close. Uh, then there, there there's a mixture of other ones like um, Iranians, Turk, uh, um, Europeans, and, and so forth. But um, in computer science, there's a huge draw for for you to immediately go into industry because you can see the the immediate financial benefit of going to, to industry. And so it's, it's hard to compete the, with the graduate schools to compete with that. And so there aren't a lot of Americans who, who go into graduate school. So there's a lot of international students. And so it was awesome. I got to, I got to meet a lot of people, like I said, from India and China, and I got to learn a lot more about them and their cultures and their perspective, it gave me a much better understanding of, say, you know, what does it mean to be a, a Hindu from talking to someone actually from India than any reading of any book is ever going to, to give me. Um, I had a much better understanding of, um, of, you know, what, <clears throat> um, what they, experience because we we're with each other all the time and and what um, how what difficulties they encountered in things like um, immigration status and and visas and and all these um, issues that I wouldn't have even been aware of in, in if I were just surrounded by a bunch of other Americans and that, so that was a wonderful experience for me too. Um, uh, yeah, I, 
uh, I loved what I did. I loved that I was able to do it. Um, it was fascinating to me. Um, and I got paid to do it on top of that. It's like, what more, what more can you ask for? Um, so, um, if that sounds like something that you're interested in, if that's the type of learner that you are, if that's the type of environment that you want to put yourself in, that's grad school is the right fit for you. Um, and you should begin to pursue it now. Uh, probably the next steps for you, if that, if that is you, are that the, you need to begin to start to do your research on that graduate advisor that I told you is, is helpful. These are people that interest me. These are people that are not interesting to me. And then you need to pursue the application process at the institutions with those individuals. Um, in parallel, you need to set up a time to do the GRE exam, graduate record examination. Um, almost every graduate degree at any institution requires the GRE. Um, and so this is a test that measures, it's hard to say what it measures, but it's supposed to measure, I guess, readiness for graduate school of all kinds. So it's got some logic, it's got some vocabulary and English and maybe some math involved in there. But this isn't math like you need this to become a computer engineer or astrophysicist. This is math that everyone in any degree program should know. Right, so it hasn't really gotten any more sophisticated than the math from the SAT kind of math. Um, so there's there's three parts to it. There's the math, there's the reasoning or the logic, and the English. And you better bet that in our field, everyone can score highly on those math and reasoning portions. Um, and and then the the English kind of gets like okay yeah it looks like you can read um, <laughs> uh, so you have to take the GRE and the expectation is that you're just going to score well so basically they won't even look at the GRE it's kind of like yep they did what we expected high in math high in reasoning fine in English. And so that's not at all going to distinguish you from any of the other applicants at all. Okay. So unlike at an undergraduate where maybe like a really good SAT or ACT kind of opens some eyes at admissions, it's kind of like just the expected behavior here. Okay. So you have to do good in the GRE. You can't blow it off. You have to do good. But it's not going to differentiate you at all from anyone else who's applying for a computer science or computer engineering degree. What is going to differentiate you are your letters of recommendation and projects that you've done as an undergraduate. That's one of the reasons why you benefit from being here at Taylor because you have made relationships with us as faculty and we can, if you've done it, we can write amazing letters of recommendation for you because we've seen what you've done and we've interacted with you much more than ever could have happened at some, you know, giant university. And those are the things that are going to differentiate you from the other applicants. Because we can say with certainty, I know that this person is going to succeed in research because they've succeeded for me and as an undergraduate in ways that most undergraduates don't even get a chance to. So start talking to us about opportunities for writing letters of recommendation for you. That's really where what's going to differentiate you from everyone else in the field. Yeah, Kendall. 
So the letter of recommendation meanwhile came from the Big Science undergrad professor being a employer at the internship in the field. So um usually yes. The reason why is because usually your employer doesn't know what the expectations for research in a graduate school are. So they can, some of the things that an employer will speak to are, are still highly valuable. The reliability, your ability to apply yourself and work in an open-ended situation, um, self-independent, all those are gonna be seen as, as valuable. But they're probably not gonna be able to say, this person is gonna be able to use these skills in a research context. So I, I, so what I'm saying is don't throw away those things, but don't just make it employer oriented. There are some exceptions. Uh, that is uh, employers who do have a graduate degree and so can speak to that. Um, or if your degree, your work was more research oriented. There are some uh, uh, kind of like where Adam worked this summer. It's much more of a researchy place. And so they, they have more already connections with these kind of research companies. And so, uh, so it really depends upon the employer. And so I can't say absolutely no. But um, in general, as a broad brush stroke, we give a little bit better letters of recommendation than an employer. All right. Remember, next week is going to be the standardized test. All right. It's not a terrible thing. I'll put up a example exam. Come prepared to, to do your best and help us as a department understand what you have learned and um, what, uh, if any areas of improvement we have, in, curricularly speaking. Um, and so I appreciate that from all of you. Um, have a great evening, everyone, and I'll see you then. Thank you.